It's the week ending Saturday the 11th of April and this is The Week Unwrapped. In the past seven days, we've seen Boris Johnson admitted to intensive care with coronavirus, global COVID-19 cases approaching 1.5 million, and the death of legendary Bond girl, actor Honor Blackman, aged 94. But we're here to bring you some of the stories that passed under the radar this week. Big news, not making headlines right now, but with repercussions for all our lives. I'm Ollie Mann, let's unwrap the week. And joining me from the week's digital team is Joe Evans and Gabriel Power. And from the week US, we have Jessica Hullinger. And Gabriel, I believe this is your first remote recording, but I know that you took part in some Zoom-based drinks recently because I've seen the photo evidence. (laughs) Yes, it is my first uh, remote podcast. But yes, we did have a... uh, We usually have a pub club at our work and we decided to do it remotely yesterday. And that was very pleasant. But you didn't do house party, so no Pictionary. (laughs) No next time. Uh, Okay, Jess, you're up first. What do you think this week will be remembered for? Is another disaster looming at Chernobyl? In this very building, the Palace of Culture, is where I had my wedding ceremony. It was special not just because it was my only marriage, but also because the witness was Alexei Ananenka, one of those legendary men who went under the reactor to release the water. When the Chernobyl nuclear plant melted down, the actions of the wedding witness Ananenko helped prevent a far worse explosion. He survived, but 28 of his fellow liquidators died of radiation sickness. Chernobyl reactor engineer Alexei Bruce on ITV News. Uh, Jessica, what's the story? So over the weekend, um, two forest fires ignited within the Chernobyl exclusion zone, which is the 1,000 square mile area in Ukraine surrounding the nuclear plant. Um, And this area... incidentally? (laughs) <laughs> well, in, in this case, um, they believe that the fires were set, at least one of them was set intentionally by, um, I think, a 27-year-old who says that he was just lighting fires for fun. Um, and it spread pretty quickly, obviously. Um, and this area is, of course, very radioactive. The fires have been releasing radiation and the radiation levels in the area are 15 times higher than normal at the moment. Well, that all sounds very dramatic, uh, but 15 times higher than what normal? Normal for the Chernobyl exclusion zone, which is very high levels of radiation anyway, hence no one lives there, or 15 times higher than they should be safely for someone to live, because in which case, why does it matter if no one lives there? <laughs> yeah, so they're, they're 15 times higher than than their normal recordings, which is already uh, a, a level beyond what people are comfortable with. Um, and, and actually, people do live there. There are some people who, who still live in the area. Um, they are actually, they've been allowing um, tourists into the area in recent years. The levels of radiation are still high relatively, um, but they aren't harmful in like small doses. Um, but, the, but the problem is that the, the levels are much higher now than they had been before. The Radiation stays trapped in soil and in vegetation, in trees, um, and actually since the disaster, um, the area, of course, has not seen much foot traffic, so uh, the, the the forests have um, grown, and so the area is covered in vegetation. Um, it's all quite dry, um, which makes it a sort of uh, a tinderbox. Um, and actually, forest fires there are not uncommon. They've happened um, a number of times over the last uh, several decades, um, and the concern, I mean, of of course, not a whole lot of people are there right right now, and so it's not like this is going to affect you and me necessarily right now. But the concern is that um, these wildfires are, are going to keep happening, um, and they could release uh, radiation into the environment. So radioactive materials could be swept up in smoke um, and then hit the environment, and then travel much like they did um, during the original disaster. They could travel in a sort of plume uh, and contaminate other parts of the world. And I guess most alarmingly for people living in Ukraine, Joe, I mean, obviously this is on their doorstep. Uh, How do they uh, react to this sort of news over there? So as Jess rightly says, um, the the concern is that the fires will spread over the rest of Europe in a sort of plume, as happened in 1986. The authorities in Ukraine have sort of moved to play down concerns that this is going to be as bad as Chernobyl was in 1986. They've kind of suggested that people can still open their windows and that they shouldn't sort of lockdown any more so than most countries already are because of a different kind of health issue um but yeah ukrainian people will obviously be a lot more concerned than than we should be um and obviously the memory of what happened in the mid 80s will sort of be reignited by the idea that they could be could be covered in radioactive waste from 
um, from the exclusion zone. But as I say, authorities have moved to say not to sort of shut your windows and, and not allow fresh air into your house and that it is still safe to do so. And it's that cloud, isn't it, Gabriel? The cloud of fear and anxiety about this story that's really going to spread across Europe if this story gets traction rather than perhaps actual radioactivity. It's it's the scepticism, the cynicism and the fear about nuclear power, which is something that governments all over the world are looking at because of reasons we've discussed in the past, environmental action. Yeah, so um, I, I think that the... Ukrainian authorities' decision to downplay the, the the scale of the fire and the effects that it might have are, are p- fairly legitimate. I don't think that there is a huge amount of radiation being released, and certainly the the level that it has dropped to, as uh, or the level that the radiation, the background radiation in the region has dropped to, is is easily safe. You can you can't exactly live there now, but you can visit. Um, and so I I and I don't think that the level that is that is being released by this forest fire is remotely harmful. The problem that they're having is that this seems to be a fairly a regular occurrence. They get forest fires there quite a lot. They had a major one in 2008, which also had similar effects of releasing at, uh, radiation into the atmosphere. Um, and so what they need to do uh, more than anything is change their laws, in my opinion, um, on forest fires and or arson. Because... Um, Setting fire to grass, which is the the comp- which is what caused this one, was thought to have caused this one, uh, is a violation that carries a, a a penalty of 175 Ukrainian hryvnias, which is about five pounds. Um, so the it's clear that there's not enough disincentive to to for people who are looking to I don't know start fires for fun, which is apparently something that happens in northern Ukraine. But, um, well, is it, yeah, I, uh, Jess? Or do, do you think that the person who was supposedly setting fires for fun was trying to make a statement about Chernobyl or was actually even worse, deliberately trying to enact some environmental terrorism by releasing this radiation? I have no idea what the what the motivation for setting fire to anything is. Um, but I do think that changing the laws and penalizing people for, for lighting fires is, you know, it's one thing, but I... I think the larger problem um, is that this area is going to continue to become more and more dry. Uh, Climate change um, is going to make Ukraine hotter. Um, 2019 was the hottest year on record in Ukraine. Um, Various regions are hit by long-lasting drought. Um, and again, if, if, if the exclusion zone is an un, untended to uh, tinderbox, I mean, it's going to become e- much easier for, for fires to spread there. Um, so I don't know that, that just finding people for lighting fires is going to help. Um, but I do think like it, it's, it's quite concerning to think about like how much radiation is just sitting underneath a very thin layer of soil um, and what happens if that's disrupted. Mm. There was a a 2015 um, study from the University of South Carolina that estimated that wildfires from between 2008 and 2010 had already redistributed 8% of the radiation that had been found within the soil in the area that those wildfires um, struck. Um, And the soot from those fires can can carry contaminant soil and that can land uh, on various different regions. Uh, so yeah, it's a little bit scary that like a, a little bit of disruption could um, could cause such a, a health threat that we previously, you know, we previously have thought for a long time that that the disaster was contained. In terms of this story being underreported, though, Joe, I mean, uh, you know, in, in preparation for this show this morning, I googled the story to see where it had gained traction, and it is in the Sun. Uh, and in fact, if you click through various links on the Sun's website, you'll see that they report quite frequently on anything happening at Chernobyl. There's drone footage of the deserted town and, you know, there's lots of nerdy details, especially for a tabloid, quite in-depth details about, you know, levels of radiation and the animals that have died and all this sort of thing. So there's obviously a nerdy interest in Chernobyl around the world. It's not as if people are ignoring what's happening there. I think that's probably true. And I think also with the success of the HBO show, Chernobyl has kind of been put back onto the agenda slightly. I think what's interesting about this story and is maybe the, the, the detail about this story that makes it interesting and makes it important for our lives is that when you kind of watch a program like Chernobyl that's obviously set in the Soviet Union with men in old fashioned looking suits, smoking old fashioned looking cigarettes, it can feel like a very distant, distant event. And I think that what this story kind of evidences is the fact that the kind of fallout, for lack of a better description, of that event is still affecting our lives today and, and could continue to affect the lives of Europeans across 
across the continent if if these fire fires are allowed to continue. Gabe. Um, yeah, it's interesting that Joe says that because in uh, 2016 they rolled over um, a big uh, like a sarcophagus thing to to dismantle the the reactor from the inside, um, and so it felt like that was them kind of drawing a line under the effect of it because the the sarcophagus that had originally been housing the destroyed reactor was crumbling, and there was a risk that if that collapsed, then it would release more atmosphere and then would have the same kind of thing happen all over again. But now that that's covered, I felt like the story did have a line drawn underneath it until, as you say, Chernobyl, the HBO show, um, kicked off. And it, it is, I mean, I wouldn't suggest that people rush there, but I went there um, in 2016 and it is incredibly eye-opening um, and well, for, for lack of a less cliched term. And um, yeah, it, it's it's quite scary and much sadder than I anticipated. I don't know why, but at, like there's a lot of disaster tour of my f- tourism, I feel, focuses on the quirky or the you know, like the novelty of, of something, but Chernobyl is, is really depressing. When you say you went there, where, so you, did you go on an official tour and did they take you actually sort of close to the reactor? Yeah, um, so I, you can't go to Chernobyl without a guided tour, so we had to um, I wasn't organize one. To. <laughs> no. uh, so we had to organise one. We stayed in Kiev and then we got driven up and you have to sign loads of um, waivers and uh, all sorts of documents to say that you won't touch this, you won't go in this building, you won't do this, you won't do that. But then when you get there, the guides are just like, yeah, do what you want. And then you just kind of, uh, you can, you know, I was walking through abandoned supermarket aisles and standing in empty gymnasium pools and stuff. It was very surreal. And I guess your fear, Jess, is that uh, you won't need to be a disaster tourist to go and see the impacts of Chernobyl now. It might once again start visiting upon the rest of Earth. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing that we have to remember is that, um, like we've talked about, radio- radioactive um, material doesn't stay in one place. It's very easily picked up and it's very easily moved. I mean, it travels in the wind and um, it falls in the rain and then it, it freezes, actually. So a study last year um, uh, looked at man-made radiation from nuclear fallout, but also um, from things that happened years ago, like weapons testing. Um, and they found that this kind of man-made radioactive material, it, it's settles um, in water, which eventually freezes. So they found it um, across the world in like in glaciers and um, in in frozen, uh, you know, in snow and and that kind of thing. And so the, the problem, of course, is that um, as this ice thaws, the, the radioactive material flows into our water sources um, and into the ground. And so I think, you know, the larger picture here is that um, the our actions over the years um, and going forward have huge consequences and this stuff doesn't go away. The The decay uh, time for this, for radioactive materials is, is, is hundreds of thousands of years. So, um, you know, we'll be grappling with the consequences of our actions for a really long time. Good. A good uplifting news story there. Thank you for that. As <laughs> if we didn't have you enough to worry about. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, Joe, you're up next after this. Okay, Joe, your turn. What do you think this week will be remembered for? How Rwanda unearthed new horrors in a week of reconciliation. You can measure and understand where we have been and where we are now. And sometimes you you want to think, is there a reason behind it? Is there a reason why people would want this story to keep running? That was the president of Rwanda, Paul Kagame, speaking to Time. Uh, Joe, that was last year. So what's happened this week? So this week, a valley dam has been dug up in Rwanda. Um, Authorities suggest that it could contain about 30,000 bodies, um, which have been discovered more than a quarter of a century after the country's genocide. Um, It's also very striking because the 7th of April is the date on which the genocide began in 1994. So the discovery kind of coincides with the country's memorials and sort of week of reconciliation when they when they hold a lot of events to to remember the events in which um 800,000 Tutsi and moderate Hutus were murdered across the country. And I mean that's such a shocking discovery if it really was just a discovery but I presume as is the nature of most of these things in Rwanda someone's leaked some information someone has confessed to where bodies are buried you don't just stumble across 30,000 bodies. 
Yeah, so every now and then um, graves of genocide victims are still discovered. Um, it often happens when people are released from uh, from prison, and that is yeah. the case um, in this example. Um, it was discovered when somebody who had served their, served their sentence for their actions during the genocide was released and, um, yeah, revealed the location of one of these sort of mass burial sites, as, as often happens around the world in places where genocides have taken place. I mean, Jess, it's so horrific to imagine something so recent being uncovered as a kind of historical artefact and the impact that would have on the national psyche. But I guess the thing about Rwanda is uh, the random people live with that being in their recent memorable past all the time. In a strange way, as Joe says, there might be a sort of timeliness to the fact that this has happened upon the anniversary of, of the genocide beginning. Yeah, I mean, I think also... Um, a lot of people right now are not able to uh, properly observe the anniversary because of the, I'm sorry to bring up the C word, but the coronavirus lockdown there has prevented people from leaving their homes. So the only way that they can really mark this anniversary is um, by watching um, the television. Um, and of course, this leaves a huge um, scar uh, on, on one psyche. Um, and the Rwandan people, I mean, even kids who, of course, weren't even born uh, uh, when the genocide was happening, they grow up with this um, at the forefront of their minds it's it's sort of drilled into them they know that this happened and they know that um they know that they can't really let it happen again and and actually i think that um the discovery of this now um is interesting because of course one of the problems with um with with grieving and mourning and moving forward is that you often need to have closure and you need to know where your loved one is and what's happened to them and a lot of people don't know what happened to their their family members um and so in a way, the more we discover um, these graves, as horrific as it is, the more possibly people might be able to mourn and move forward and grieve. Yeah, but Gabriel, I mean, what timing? I mean, if you are in lockdown at the moment with the coronavirus and then you find out that one of your relatives has been exhumed in a dam and you can't go to see them and you presumably can't have a funeral in any case, not to get too vivid and grim about it, but what state is their body going to be in now, 26 years later? I mean, that's a lot of information for anyone to process. It is, um, and it would obviously be harder if, if you were locked up at home, but um, I, I feel like, unfortunately, it's, it's something that a, a disproportionately large amount, large number of people in Rwanda face compared to the uh, families of victims of other genocides in the past, perhaps. It's a reality that a lot of families... Uh, and friends of victims of the Rwandan genocide face because um, in the Rwandan capital of Kigali there are um, there's a Kigali genocide memorial and the remains of about 250,000 victims are there which is still only about a quarter of the people thought to have been killed in the genocide um, so that leaves another 750,000 odd uh, with no closure that that Jess was talking about. And Joe you mentioned that this is the sort of annual memorial stuff happening, you know, perhaps on TV and things in Rwanda. I've never heard about a big reconciliation project in Rwanda. Why not? So it's a striking example, actually, in talking to, in talking about reconciliation following a genocide, in that reconciliation in Rwanda, unlike other places, for example, say Cambodia, which I talked about a couple of weeks ago on the podcast, was very much a sort of homegrown process. Um, there was no sort of huge UN mission to, to, to arrive and sort of set up human rights courts. Instead, what happened is they founded lots and lots of these gachacha courts, which kind of means justice among the grass. And it dates back to before Rwanda was, col uh, was colonised. Um, and it's kind of a community court. Um, the idea of this was that you could kind of establish truth about what happened, um, sort of remove the culture of impunity around people that kind of perpetrated the genocide and also sort of reinforce unity and, and try to reconcile Rwandans within communities by having the courts take place sort of within communities rather than on a sort of larger scale with, with outside observers. Um, the issue with the, they've been sort of heavily criticised from a legal standpoint in that they kind of don't provide the same sort of legal, um, they're not necessarily kind of backed by the same sort of solid legal principles that say the Hague would be backed by. However, they, they seem to have rendered sort of rudimentary justice to a degree. Um, Kachacha courts sort of ran for about a decade from 2005 to about 2015. Um, and they tried about 1.2 million cases. Um, so in that regard, there has been a reconciliation process. The difference really with Rwanda is that the reconciliation process has been sort of very homegrown um, rather than sort of being imposed from, from outside the country. 
in a way, the government has taken a really heavy-handed approach to reconciliation, right? Um, like, I think the country has been sort of applauded for for making progress. I mean, you do see, see these stories of um, of families of murder victims sort of living alongside um, their murderers. Uh, and there's a sense of, like, oh, you know, things are peaceful now. Um, we've sort of papered over the divisions. But it's been really sort of... In, heavily enforced, I would say. Um, so the New York Times called it enforced social reengineering. There's a sort of compulsory community service that's enforced by the government. Um, every Rwandan citizen between the ages of 18 and 65 has to take part in a community service for three hours every month. Um, and so they also do this weird thing called a reconciliation barometer. I don't know if that is a, it, that, help, that happens elsewhere, but they measure um, how well people are sort of living and cooperating with one another. Um, but it's 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 been really heavily orchestrated by by the government um and and they also there's a question about whether or not Kagame's government despite having done objectively quite a lot of you know good things um h- how free these people really are so Kagame he enacts laws that are ostensibly meant to sort of prevent the spread of hate speech and sort of make people uh you know be peaceful with one another but it's he actually also uses those kinds of speech to to those rules to tamp down on anti-government speech. So there's there's some question about how um, you know how how free these people really are and how heavy-handed um, his his government has been. I think Jess's point about the government's sort of heavy-handed approach to reconciliation sort of speaks to a contradiction at the heart of sort of modern Rwanda. The government has pursued a very heavy-handed approach to reconciliation, but it's discernibly had a positive impact. And similarly, Kagame, to his critics as an authoritarian and to sort of Western governments that he wooed in the sort of early 2000s, is a sort of visionary leader, as, as Blair called him. Um, yet, you know, that is the sort of contradiction at the heart of modern Rwanda. It's a, it's a country that is developing incredibly quickly. Child mortality has halved. The parliament has got the highest proportion of female members in the world. Per capita gross domestic product is, is rising rapidly. And it, it's one of Africa's sort of rising stars. At the same time, it's ruled by a guy who won the 2010 election with 93% of the votes. The three major opposition parties were excluded from the ballot. And, and so in that sense, the, the sort of heavy-handed approach to reconciliation is sort of indicative of the heavy-handed approach to rebuilding the country that Kagame has taken over the last two decades. OK, Gabriel, you're up next after this. Okay, Gabriel, your turn. You are finishing the show this week. What do you think this week will be remembered for? Was this the week that Prague knocked Moscow off its pedestal? Protesters cheered as an activist climbed the scaffolding to tear down the tarpaulin and then berated police as he was led away. Some carried signs reading, You won't rewrite history. A clip from Radio Free Europe's YouTube channel. Uh, Gabriel, what's the story? Uh, This week, authorities in Prague, the capital of the Czech Republic, uh, removed a controversial monument to Soviet Russian Marshal Ivan Konyev, who was twice designated a hero of the Soviet Union by Stalin and whose remains are buried in the Kremlin. Um, The removal has has caused a bit of a rift between the Czech Republic and Russia and has prompted uh, protests from Moscow and the Russian embassy in the Czech Republic as Konyev led Konyev, sorry, led the, the liberation of the Czech capital from the Nazis in 1945, but has mm-hmm. since been uh, has since been kind of revised as a, as a slightly villainous figure in Czech history and in a lot of Central Europe because of his later Because actions. he was involved in building the Berlin Wall and <laughs> imposing Soviet rule on Czechoslovakia. He was. He did those two things. His, main, his biggest controversy is his, um, his role in the crushing of the 1956 Hungarian Revolution, in which Soviet soldiers you know, fired on unarmed civilians. It was, it was a bit of a mess. Okay. I mean, so there's, there's two sides, basically. There are the local Czechs that live... Uh, it, sorry, it's Prague, isn't it? Prague 6, yeah. There are the local Czechs that live in Prague 6, which is the district of the capital where this statue resides, who obviously the majority of them don't like the statue being there because of their recent-ish memories of what he did after the war. And then there's Russia, who, reflecting on what he did as a Soviet war hero defeating the Nazis, rather like the fact that he had a statue there. Is there like a moderate middle ground who just says let's put up a second plaque explaining that he was a complex historical figure. I mean, why do these debates always boil down to let's remove it or let's keep it up? 
Uh, well, it's funny you should say that because in 2018, uh, the Council of Prague 6, the, the district that the statue is in, um, changed the, the plaque. So the plaque that originally went on in 1980 when the statue was erected uh, was very, you know, pro-Soviet, very pro-communist, very, you know, gave a kind of glowing review of his defeat of the Nazis. And then um, in 2018, they changed it to add information about his role in the Hungarian uprising, his role in crushing the Czech uprising of 1968, or the, uh, sorry, the Soviet invasion of the Czech Republic, uh, of Czechoslovakia in 1968, and also his, his role in the Berlin Wall. And so, it, and Moscow criticized them for that as well. But the thing is that in the wake of that plaque change, it appears that a lot of anti-Soviet or anti-communist uh, supporters in Prague have taken that as an excuse to vandalize the statue. It happens all the time and it keeps getting covered in, in pink paint. And mm -hmm. so the Russian embassy in Prague kept saying, um, oh, you can't get rid of this statue. You can't get rid of this statue. It's so you know precious to us. And then in 2019, in August, it got vandalized at one more time. And Prague Six Council said, look, we'll give you this statue we'll, we'll put it in the russian embassy so that you can take care of it it won't get vandalized and you can be in charge of the cleanup and all that sort of stuff and the russian embassy refused so then prague six said right let's get rid of the statue entirely and now the russian embassy is throwing you know throwing a bit of a tantrum over it even though it's only getting moved to a museum they're not destroying it or putting it out of sight they're putting it in a museum which i think is kind of a more respectful move than to just let it be vandalized all the time. So I think there is a middle ground. I, I don't think it's as black and white as, as as Moscow in particular is making it seem. I mean, Jess, from the outside, when you're not living in the Czech Republic and you don't have a grounding in kind of, you know, the Soviet uh, rule of Czechoslovakia and all the rest of it, this just feels a bit petty. Uh, you know, you just sort of think, well, the statue's there because it was put there at the time because the people that ran the city at the time thought it was a good thing to have a statue of. You can contextualise the history of that without taking it away, putting it in a museum or destroying it. And these rails about statues always seem to me to say more about the current national debates that are happening in a country or, or a sense of a people's own self-identity than it does about the man, usually, that they're debating. Yeah, I think that's really true. I mean, Russia is using this uh, in its propaganda to say that uh, the Czech Republic is trying to sort of rewrite history. And of course, Russia takes a lot of offense at the idea of there being anything wrong with the Soviet role in, in the war. Um, you know, Putin himself has said that he regrets the fall of the Soviet Union and wants to protect the Russian ideology of authoritarian powers. And, um, you know, so I think that like this can very easily be spun into a sort of prop propaganda message. Um, but yeah, it, it does seem petty, but, but it's, it taps into undercurrent uh, that runs very strong. And I think it also sort of highlights divisions within Czech society more broadly. Prague uh, is quite liberal and wants to be seen as having a sort of Western orientation. Um, but the the president um, is a far right populist and he wants to strengthen ties with Russia, um, not the EU or with NATO. Um, and he's considered sort of the the face of pro-Russia circles in the country. Um, and I, was, I don't think there's any um, doubt about the fact that there's a connection as well between the fact that um, he uh, was Russia has been widely recognized to have meddled in the elections to help get um, get the the president of um, the Czech Republic into power. So yeah, I think it it highlights a lot of really interesting um, political dynamics happening there. And that emotional reaction from Russia, Joe, speaks to a time where perhaps Putin's Russia is less concerned about seeming distant from the USSR. I think that's that's absolutely right. Um, as as Jess rightly points out, Putin has spoken about sort of the fall of the Soviet Union more extensively in the sort of last five years than he did in the sort of ten years before that. It's also interesting that it speaks to a sort of strange characteristic within sort of Russian politics and the sort of Russian's own memory of itself. I suppose it's strange that they're sort of upset about the historical revisionism that's taking place or that they perceive to be taking place in Prague when sort of the most fa famous example of historic historic sort of uh, revisionism ever is the sort of Stalinist editing of photographs and sort of Nikolai, <laughs> Nikolai Yeznov being the most famous example, the sort of famous vanishing commissar. It's also true that sort of in the last sort of 20 years as well, sort of Russian society sort of reimagines its own history fairly regularly. The, the sort of memory of the siege of Leningrad is a famous example where 
the sort of looting and theft and cannibalism that sort of grew out of that siege are completely sort of rewritten in the Russian history books and also sort of the history of the Russian Orthodox Church as well, which towards the end of the Soviet Union was heavily um, intertwined with the KGB. And in modern Russia, they often sort of celebrate the sort of new martyrs of the Russian Orthodox Church who, who fought for their religion during the Soviet Union when it was being suppressed, but often sort of forget that those who kind of confronted the suffering on those martyrs often were also sort of church leaders. Um, there's, a, there's a very famous uh, piece of writing called The Wily Man in which a sort of Russian sociologist called um, Yuri Levadov um, spoke about the sort of characteristics that make up a Russian citizen and its disability to sort of simultaneously play two characters, one of which has got a very good memory for, the, for, for its history and one of which sort of selectively remembers. And it seems interesting that Russia is now sort of attacking sort of Prague-based politicians for historical revisionism when they're sort of Champions League winners of historical revisionism. Well, the question of what their response is, or or should be, or has been perhaps, Gabe, is one of the things people are focusing on, isn't it? The Russian embassy said, the dismantlement of a monument to Marshal Ivan Konyev will not be left without the Russian side's appropriate response. What is an appropriate response to a statue being taken down in a foreign land? Well, um, that probably is for Russia to decide, I guess. But one thing that happened was on Monday, uh, a a self-described nationalist Bolshevik group called The Other Russia attacked the Czech embassy in Moscow with smoke bombs and waved a flag reading Stop Fascism and wrote this very strange open letter in which they said, our tanks will be in Prague, Russia is everything, the rest is nothing, and said that the Czech government was justifying Nazism, which was a very... uh, a rather extreme interpretation of of the moving of a statue... But there's not necessarily a conclusion that can be drawn that those people represent Putin, is there? No, no, I mean, as absolutely always, not. You know, they're masked men. They appear to be embodying the sentiment of what many people at senior levels in Russia think. But yeah. it's not clear cut. No, it isn't clear cut at all. There's, there's no evidence to suggest that they are linked, this group at all. But Russian authorities, from the government to these like fringe extremists, the World War II, the defeat of the Nazis in World War II is like a kind of strange sacred cow, as I read one expert describe it. And so it's something that really permeates through a lot of Russian society. But it is unusual that they would take such an issue with this removal of this statue now, when in 1962, the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia, which is obviously allied to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, um, removed a giant statue of Stalin, saying that it was a source of embarrassment and that, you know, they were going through a process of de-Stalinization. 60 years later, to have the removal of a, of a, of a statue of a much lesser, less important figure uh, become such a kind of hot topic of debate is, is strange and unusual, and it indicates that both sides might be uh, yeah, using this for some sort of political gain. And, and that has also been mooted by... Uh, pro-Russian supporters who suggest that the local council in Prague that removed the statue did so during the outbreak so that they wouldn't have to face much resistance. Yeah, and you do wonder, I mean, we've presented uh, you with three pretty heavy stories in this week's edition as it happens, but you do wonder how many bad news stories are being buried right now by various different governments around the world because people's attentions are elsewhere. Uh, We will be bringing them to you in future editions, no doubt, (laughs) because that is what we do here. But that is it for this edition of The Week Unwrapped. My thanks to Gabriel, Jessica and Joe. Statues of all three of you coming soon, no doubt. Uh, Remember, you can listen to The Week Unwrapped's entire back catalogue now. Search for The Week Unwrapped on your podcast app of choice. I've been Ollie Mann. Our music is by Tom Morby, the producer Sarah Miles at Rethink Audio. And until we meet again to unwrap next week, bye-bye.